Hi everyone, I want to introduce myself to you. I'm Victoria Langland and I'm a professor at the University of Michigan in the Department of History. I'm a historian of Latin America and I used to be the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and in that capacity I know a lot about what you are doing this week at the GMEI. Um, it's a fantastic program and I'm so delighted that you get to be a part of it. I'm really sorry that I'm not there with you but I nonetheless thought I would record this video to set you up to think about some of the things that you're going to see at Friendship Park, because I know that's one of the stops that you're going to make when you're in Tijuana this year. And so um, I've been there a couple of times. I find it really, really interesting. And because of that, I put together a slideshow and some comments that I think will help you as you navigate the park yourself and as you think about how thinking about monuments both here and in other aspects of your lives might be helpful in your classroom. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, as I said before, I'm a historian of Latin America. I don't study borders per se, and I don't study the U.S.-Mexico border. Instead, I'm really interested in monuments. Um, my monuments, you can think of these as sort of plaques, statues, sculptures, road signs, gravestones, sort of physical markers of some sort that are intended to mark the past in some kind of way so that we in the present and others in the future will recognize that past as meaningful, as having some kind of significance. Now, the monuments that I studied were uh, from mostly South America, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, um, and they are monuments that were erected in the aftermath of really, really difficult and conflictive periods of Latin American history, what we think about as periods of state terrorism. And so these are a couple of examples, right? A, a monument to victims of torture in Brazil, this big sculpture by a, a very, um, very talented artist, um, a monument to the disappeared in Argentina, or a park made from a former torture center in Chile, uh, and one aspect of the Parque de Plaza for Peace. So you can kind of think of those as examples. But you can also think of more ephemeral, less permanent markers as kind of monuments. You could imagine flowers left at the site of an accident, or murals that people know are going to be painted over, but they nonetheless want to paint them anyway. Um, we have kind of an example of that in Ann Arbor, a rock that people continually paint over with meanings that are important to them or art that is deliberately supposed to disappear. And these are two examples of that. Um, on the left here, um, Alfredo Alfonso in Argentina did some chalk drawings um, that he knew would not exist. Or Nelly Azevedo in Brazil made a monument here called Melting Men in 2009, which has a little bit of a, a deliberately ambiguous meaning. It might be about a monument to the nameless, faceless individuals who make up history, it might be a monument to global warming and what's happening to us. It might be a critique to monuments themselves. As you can probably see from the picture, these are sculptures made out of ice, which deliberately kind of disappear. So it is not going to last, and she knew that, right? But all monuments seek to deliver some kind of message, right? They might be designed to honor or celebrate someone. Um, they might be to learn from past mistakes or any other kind of meaning. So again, the monuments that I studied, which emerged from really violent pasts of state terrorism, were really interesting to me as ways to learn about how Latin American societies were grappling with that past. Because one of the things I want to point out is that these monuments don't just appear out of nowhere, or they're not just kind of willed into being by states. They are the result of extended debates, right? So whenever I see monuments, I think about like, who made them, right? Why did they make them? How did they do so? Whose interests did they serve? Um, and each one, what they received in terms of responses were not always what the artists themselves anticipated. Um, sorry, somebody just walked by. Um, so by studying what they meant for people and how those meanings changed over time, that study told me a lot about post-dictatorship society. And I bet if you think about today's world in the United States in particular, you can think about how much more aware I think we've become of monuments whether or not they reflect the values that we hold today, whether or not we want to hold on to them. Um, so you can imagine that we've asked ourselves these very questions about who put these together? Why are they here? Do we still want to be confronted with these images? What kind of meanings are they conveying to us? And any other kind of monument that's either erected or taken down or, or um, vandalized or remarked in some way. And so some of the questions that I'm posing to you are the kinds of questions that I would suggest that we always ask of monuments and that we could ask our students to think about whenever you see a monument. Think like, 
that's just not here forever. It emerged at some moment. When was it made? Right? We saw that with the question about the many of those Confederate sculptures were created not after the Civil War, but during Reconstruction. Right? Um, who made them? What, why might they have been made? Who used them or who uses them? Who goes to a site to sort of um, take stock in that spot? What have they meant for different groups of people? How have these meanings changed over time? And what do those meanings tell us today or in the past? So those are all just kind of introductory questions that I think are really interesting about monuments. Um, as I said earlier, I wanted to speak about monuments be and, and history because I saw that as really present in Friendship Park, this place that you're going to go to. Um, I've been there a couple of times, both as a civilian and as a participant in the GMEI. Every time I've been there, it's been different, and I'm sure it will be different for you as well, as you will see things that are different from what I saw a year ago. Um, but it's a really fascinating place, and so I hope you find it interesting. Um, so let me just tell you what I'm going to do with the rest of this presentation. I want to talk about border parks along the U.S. border, because Friendship Park is not the only one, so you can kind of put it into context with other border parks. I want to talk about the history of Friendship Park, and then I want to go back to what I was kind of teasing you with a little bit and to think about Friendship Park as a monument to the border and what kind of a monument it is. So let me talk first about border parks. The U.S. has four border parks. These are bi-national parks that share land and access across the border. Um, so we can, uh, we can think about um, how these parks along the U.S. border have sought to reinforce the binational relationships between adjoining countries. Three of these four border parks are on the northern border of the United States, so the U.S. and Canada, and only one is on the southern border, and that's the, the border park that you're going to visit this week. Uh, so of those four, let's, I'm just going to walk you through them really quickly so you can kind of get a sense of what these other border parks look like. Um, one is called the Peace Arch Park. It's between the state of Washington and the province of British Columbia. There are 22 acres um, in Canada and 20 in the United States, so pretty even there. It was founded in 1921. The arch was built in that year to commemorate the end of the War of 1812 between the U.S. and Great Britain and the treaty that followed. For the treaty at the end of that war said that there should no longer be a militarized border between the two countries, that we shouldn't need a militarized border anymore. Uh, and that, I don't have a photo of this, but there's a plaque that was, um, that was put up at the park in 1936 that celebrates this, quote, unfortified boundary line between the two countries and says that we need to remember that more than, sorry, we need to remember the more than century old friendship between these two countries as a lesson of peace to other countries that other countries can learn from the fact that we share a border, it's not militarized, and we have a friendly relationship. Um, so this Peace Arch Park is right next to a land border crossing, either pedestrian or by car, but the park itself is considered a bi-national zone. You can enter the park without a passport from either side. You can enjoy the park. It's a place where um, people can come in from either, either direction and, and spend time together. And this was especially helpful during the COVID-19 pandemic when the actual border was closed and one could not traverse from the U.S. Into, into Canada or vice versa, except under very, very limited circumstances. So people were able to nonetheless gather at this binational park and, you know, exchange stories and, and see one another, which was very helpful for them. Um, the second example is the Waterton Glacier Park between Montana and Alberta. Uh, it's much bigger. This is 1,800 miles, <laughs> and this is because there's a, a national park in Canada, the Waterton Lakes National Park, and Glacier National Park in the United States that share this, this or that um, abut this border. Um, both parks, by the way, are World Heritage Sites and also Biosphere Reserves declared so by UNESCO. But this was declared a binational park in 1932 after rotary clubs from both sides began meeting together and lobbying that there should be a peace park. Uh, and now in this case, in part perhaps because of the size, one does need a passport to enter, but it's still supposed to be this shared example of, um, of binationalism and peace between the, the, between, between the two countries. And then the third example I'll show you quickly is the International Peace Garden between North Dakota and Manitoba 
also formed in 1932, so there's a lot of activity in the 1930s about these, these binational parks. And in this case, it was gardening associations from both countries who requested this. They wanted to have something right near the geographical center of the U.S. Uh, of the U.S. Canadian border. Um, so both states donated land, about 2,400 acres, and they created a garden that extends across the two places. Um, in this case, again, you do need a passport to visit, but it's um, supposed to be a very um, amiable shared space for those. Now I'll note that in the 1940s, there were efforts by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Manuel Avila Camacho in Mexico to create a binational park with Mexico at Big Bend, but that did not happen for a variety of political reasons that I won't go into. But until 1970s, this was it, these three parks on the northern U.S. border and not a, a, any park on the southern border until Friendship Park, which, you're, which we will look at now. Um, Here's some images of Friendship Park. It's between California and Baja California. It's less than an acre of binational park. The U.S. part is owned by the federal government and is under the jurisdiction of the Border Patrol. And it sits right next to a California state park called Border Field Park. So it's federal government next to, uh, or federal, federal land right next to state land. Um, this slide should just give you a taste of what that looks like, and we'll be looking at a lot more images in a minute. But let's turn now to the history of Friendship Park. Where did this come from? How, was it, how did it form? And then how did it become what it is today? And I'll say that as I go into this history, this is not the result of original research, but rather I found other scholars who had done some great work on this, including two wonderful master's theses and lots of online materials. But I found it so interesting when I went to the park. I needed to know, like, where did this park come from? How did it emerge that I dug into some of these things? And what you're, what you're seeing are some of those results. So I found this photo. It's undated. I believe it's probably about 1970. And I believe that this is what the border looked like before there was a park. Um, like I said, could be late 1960s, could be early 1970s. Um, people describe it then as a place where beachgoers and surfers used to meet up, pretty casual, nothing fancy. You might consider it kind of unremarkable, except for the fact that there's this huge monument, right? This big boundary marker. And let me take a moment to tell you what these boundary markers are. Uh, these were created in the 19th century after the Mexican-American War. And to refresh your memory, that was 1846 to 1848, when um, a lot of territory uh, that, where, the, where the boundary between the United States and Mexico was redesigned and uh, renegotiated. And so at the end of that war, teams of surveyors set out, uh, Mexican and U.S. American surveyors, to make maps and to mark that boundary, some 2,000 miles. It took six years to kind of mark the boundary. And as they did, they marked it with a variety of kind of st um, structures to show that they had been here and that this is exactly where the boundary between the U.S. and Mexico uh, existed. As they did, they numbered them from 1 to 258. And they used different kinds of materials depending on who was there and what terrain it was and what year it was. So you can see there's you know piles of stones, there's bronze, there's marble. So this is the original monument number one, photographed back in 1890. It had been built in 1848. Sometime in that period between 1848 and 1890, it got damaged and vandalized, which of course makes me want to know who was protesting and what they were protesting and why they vandalized it, but I don't know that. Um, but they had a new survey in 1895 where they decided to kind of remark the boundary or the, the border between the U.S. and Mexico again, and they redid all the markers, especially the ones that were falling apart, and then they renumbered them. And number one became number 258, so they kind of switched the order in which those, those were numbered. And that original marker in the area of Tijuana became number 258 and was rebuilt in 1898. Um, and this is the one that is still in Friendship Park today that you're going to see. Now, it's in part because of the existence of this boundary marker that people wanted to establish a binational park in that spot. In part, they recognized that this marker itself was historic, that it marked a historic moment in the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico, and it itself was a kind of um, you know, monument in itself uh, that deserved recognition. This really begins, though, in the 1950s and 1960s. 
there's a group in California called the South Bay Historical Society that decided they wanted to organize and try to create a binational park. These are mostly businessmen, um, including the head of a construction firm, who saw the area of the of the border as a place with historic importance that wasn't being recognized, that no one had kind of paid attention to that history. And they also thought it could be a really important gateway for um, Central American visitors, uh, sorry, for Latin American visitors into California, that this would be a great place to kind of welcome people. At the same time, Playas de Tijuana, the beaches in Tijuana were developing, they were getting restaurants and apartments, and it was becoming a very cool area. And I think that these entrepreneurs in California thought that that would be um, an, a, a useful gateway to bring more business and more interest into California at the same time. So in 1964, there was a proposition in California to dedicate funds to kind of preserve park or to deserve the preserve historic areas, set aside money for parks and beaches, etc., which was passed by the California population, and so a lot of money was set aside for this, and that seemed like a great opportunity to turn this into a park. But San Diego actually had other plans, and they used that money to. Um, to preserve Old Town. So you, as you're getting to know Old Town in San Diego, know that that, um, that received some of that special funding in the 1960s. But the idea to make a binational park didn't disappear, even though it didn't get that funding in the 1960s. And it becomes a reality in 1971 under the presidency of Republican President Richard Nixon. Uh, in 1971, the federal government transferred federal land to California California added its own land, and they create their side of this binational park, naming it Borderfield State Park. As you can see, First Lady Pat Nixon came to the founding of this new park. It was this beautiful affair with lots of lovely speeches about binational friendship and cooperation. You can, in fact, Google this and find on YouTube some of the speeches. Um, at one point, I know it's well remarked that Pat Nixon came to the fence. There was still this barbed wire fence and came and kind of complained about why is there still a fence here and said, you know, I hate to see a fence anywhere, but I insist at least on going over and saying ho hello to the people on the other side. But she really wished that the fence would disappear. This is a binational park and we're going to work this part out. This fence business will we'll get taken care of. Um, Unfortunately, photos from 1975 show that that fence remained, even as the park started to take on a little bit more infrastructure. You can see that they've, in these last four years, they've built a plaza with, you know, U.S. and Mexican flags, some, some plaques and markers to kind of commemorate the space. So they were on their way to making more of a, of a truly binational park, but the fence had still remained. Um, I have no, no attribution to this photo, but that's, um, that's what I read in what I see here. Now, if we move on to what happens after that park is, is set up, we can see that, unfortunately, people start to complain, particularly in California, about the park. Californians, to use the park, had to pay some kind of a, a fee to the State Park Association. On the Mexican side, there was no such fee, and so ideas of inequity start to be emerge, start to emerge, and people start to complain. They say, "Oh, the the Mexicans are supposedly taking up all the picnic tables. We pay to come in, and then we get there, and they're all taken up by Mexicans on the other side who didn't have to pay to use their side of the park." Um, later, you start to hear complaints that there's criminal activity taking place in the park. Much of this very um, with very heavily racist connotations about who might be the criminals and what's going on. Um, later, you start to see disputes between California park rangers and U.S. Border Patrol, who are both have different kinds of jurisdiction over that park. So in 1979, the wire fence gets replaced with a corrugated metal fence. So that wire fence never disappears. Instead, it becomes more, um, it becomes stronger with this corrugated metal fence. We still hear complaints throughout the 1980s, and they get picked up by the media, in fact, so it becomes kind of a bigger story, um, especially in the mid-1980s as the Reagan war on drugs takes on steam and there's growing anti-immigrant feeling in the United States. By the early 1990s, there's a lot of kind of civilian groups in California, anti-immigrant activists who start staging actions along the border in that area. In 1990, the Border Patrol builds a road next to the fence so that they can patrol the area a little bit better. 
1991, U.S. Marines built a new fence out of military surplus supplies, these huge steel strips that had been used in airstrips. They turn them up on their side and make a fence out of them. As the slide says, they later add high-intensity lights, also from military surplus, to try to make this fence more difficult to pass over. Um, but people still come to the park. They come, they meet across the border, they talk to one another. They can still hold hands through those strips of metal. There's a, enough room to, to put a hand through to hold the hand of a loved one. Um, and in 1994, there's another big push in the United States to control immigration. Um, this time under Democratic President Bill Clinton, who passes Operation Gatekeeper and sends lots of extra funds to Border Patrol. This pushes a lot of migration eastward to very rough terrain where many people die. Um, and you start to see added in reinforcements on the border around Friendship Park. So by 1995, they add a mesh screen to that fence so that people couldn't extend their hands between the steel columns anymore and couldn't touch one another. And I can show you some of these images. Um, this is, I don't think I have a date on this particular um, on this particular photo, but you can see that they've added a screen around the menu, around the monument, and they've added screens to the fencing down the beach so that um, there's both a fence there and then a screen behind it. Um, you can see pictures before that screen was placed up, or actually in, in one part of the area where they didn't put a screen right away, you could see how people would have connected to one another and talked to one another, and sometimes even very small children could pass between um, back in that moment. So later, the US Border Patrol started to prohibit people from getting what they called too close. So if Mexicans could approach the fence on their side, on the US side, Border Patrol was watching people and not letting them get there. So that was one of the ways they stopped people from, from, from connecting with one another. So we've been talking about that first fence. There were always efforts on the US side to put in a second fence as well. So from 1996 to 2005, there were a variety of legal struggles where the U.S. Bureau of Customs and Border Protection wanted to put it in a second fence, but the California Coastal Commission said there were real environmental concerns and they pushed back against that, so that didn't happen right away. But eventually the federal courts did allow the fence and the U.S. Congress approved funding. Um, and then in 2009, the federal government reclaimed that land. If you remember, I said that the federal government had donated land for the park. They reclaim it in 2009, and they begin to construct um, that second fence. They got the rights to do so in 2005. They begin constructing it in 2009, and they begin to change the original fence. They change it right around the monument, 240, that's 258, sorry about the typo, um, and they added thick mesh around all of the existing fencing. So you can see some of this. Um, here's some of the construction that they were doing around Friendship Park in 2011. Um, and by the time they're done, the monument, the border marker, is all completely zoned off with one fence and then a border road for Border Patrol and then a second fence. And then that big post that you see in the back has um, high intensity lighting and video cameras. So there's all kinds of security by there. Um, and that means that the boundary marker is really no longer shared. U.S. Americans can't see it, can't approach it anymore. It's entirely on the Mexican side based on what U.S. Border Patrol has done. Um, and you can see, I don't know if this series of photos will be very clear to you. It might be a little bit small. You can always go back and look at the slideshow later if you want to kind of zoom in on them. But um, one of uh, a, a border... Uh, someone on the border took photos every year. You can kind of see the changes to this, uh, to the structure from 2008 to 2012, which give you a big sense of what that kind of, what those changes look like. I have an image here from 2018 where you can see Border Patrol per going up and down that road. They're in the U.S. side on both, you know, uh, on the, um, on the outside of that second fence. And notice the gate in that second fence. That is a gate at the back that, in theory, allowed US Americans to go into that kind of liminal space between the two fences, which is um, on the other side of the, the Mexican fence and on the other side of the second California fence, for certain periods when they could meet with Mexican loved ones. It was always very limited. 
only a certain number of visitors at a time. It could be closed down at any time. There were just certain moments when this could happen. It was also really hard to access from the U.S. side, where you had to hike an hour and a half, sorry, a mile and a half through the, the park on just rough terrain in order to get there. Um, but it was a possibility for people to visit. It closed during the pandemic. And as far as I know, that has not reopened, that they've not made that space available. Um, it had always been a space for those who were separated by immigration status to meet one another. So U.S. Americans or people living in the U.S. side, maybe they were DACA kids, maybe they had immigration documents in flux and so they couldn't leave the U.S., maybe they were on parole and they couldn't leave the U.S. For whatever reason, they couldn't leave the United States, they could nonetheless go into that space at given moments under certain conditions and see their, their Mexican loved ones. Um, note that there's a locked door in the first border fence as well. And so if you open the locked door in the California border fence and you open the locked door on the first border fence, that's how people would enter into that liminal space and see one another. Um, and that, I should just point out, that the reason that door is there at all is because of advocacy of people like Friends of Friendship Park, which is a grassroots organization that has always argued that the park should be a more truly binational and welcoming space for people from both places. Um, they, had, in fact, had negotiated with Border Patrol to still allow visitation at certain events, and they got them to put in that gate. And so we know that there were moments when they opened the gates and people could, in fact, see one another and hug one another and touch one another closely supervised. Um, but it was something that was was very useful for a long time. So we can see an example of that in 2013. Um, so that's what I know about the history of Friendship Park. And I, I, when I look at the newspaper today, I see that there are yet more efforts under the Biden administration to change the walls at, at Friendship Park. I don't know what they look like right now. Like I said, every time you go, it might look different, both in terms of that structure and in terms of it as a monument. So here's the last part of my, of my talk today is I wanna talk about Friendship Park as a monument to the border. Um, because what we've seen so far is what governments have done, but what have people done? What have artists done? How have people reimagined that space in ways that are not just what the US government has been wanting to do? And so let me just show you what some different artists have done to kind of mark the space with their own meanings. And you'll see some of the results of maybe some of these artists and certainly the results of other people as, as you approach Friendship Park yourself. Um, one artist, Ana Teresa Fernandez, decided to paint a big chunk of it blue, um, the same color as the sky in a work she called Erasing the Border. We can't actually get rid of the fence, but let's paint it so that it blends in and you almost don't see it. And she said, you know, one of the days that she was painting, a runner who said that he runs that beach every day in Mexico toward the U.S. border, hits the fence and turns around and comes back, looked up and for a moment thought the border was gone or thought the fence was gone. And it, it allowed him for the first moment to kind of imagine, wow, what if, what if that weren't there? What if I could have kept running? What kind of world would that have looked like? Which is exactly what she was hoping to do, kind of an optical illusion as if the, the fence weren't there. Also, I don't know if you can notice in this picture, but she's wearing um, a skirt and stiletto heels, which she said was very helpful for her when Border Patrol came and wanted to sort of try to make her stop. She came down and, and was very kind and polite and tried to explain to them that she was there with her mom and she was just making an, this painting. She was an artist and they kind of let her go. So a little bit of playing with gender roles in order to um, to, to get her art to, to, to be allowed. Um, let me show you a couple pictures of an artist named Amos Gregory, who in 2013 organized um, uh, a, a mural with other deported vets, so US service people who were deported to Mexico. Um, and they painted an upside down American flag called SOS, Deported Vets in Distress, because one of this, the techniques in the military, if you are in distress, is to fly your flag upside down so that other people will know that you're in, you know, in a crisis and you need help. And so all of these vets painted an upside down American flag um, and then painted their names uh, on, on the white portions of the flag. Um, the Border Patrol um, actually told them that they had to take it down. They said it was disrespectful, gave them 48 hours to take it down. Again, that was in 2018. Oh, I wrote 2013. Oh, no, sorry. 
I think it was in 2018. Um, maybe it was 2013. Sorry, my notes aren't very clear. But nonetheless, when I was last there in 2022, it was still there. And you will find out if it's there when you visit. Uh, I'll show a couple of slides from an artist named Enrique Chu, uh, who organized some 3,000 volunteers to paint what he called the mural of brotherhood along of huge stretches of the U.S.-Mexico border, starting in Tijuana, but not exclusive to Tijuana, uh, and tried to get people to paint different messages of peace and togetherness to transform this border, inspired in part by the US presidential campaign and arguments about a big, beautiful wall. He thought, let's make it a big, beautiful wall, one in which people paint messages of hope and solidarity and resistance. And so you can see um, perhaps some of those paintings still on, the, still on the wall when you return. And then I'll point out, um, oh, those are some of, the, some of the images that the volunteers painted at that time. And then I'll point out some pictures um, painted in 2019 Oh, I have her, uh, where is her, sorry about that. Um, I don't have her name on here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll, I don't have the name of the artist right here. I will have to add it to the slideshow later. Um, but she's a, a, a scholar now. She's an, a, an artist and a scholar of um, Chicano Chicana studies at Barack College in New York, um, where she wanted to paint childhood arrivals. Um, of actual people who had been, who had come to the United States as children and to represent them in various stages of their lives. So these are real people that were painted and she also put into them, I don't know if you can see it, little QR codes. So you could go with your phone, punch in the QR codes and then hear about their life story and hear who are these many people who have crossed the border. Um, and then my last example are a couple of works by a French artist named JR. This one is in Tecate. Um, where he plays with photographs and huge and large scale to kind of, you know, make us think twice about, about the physical structure of the border and the impermeability of the border. And so I like this one very much, um, and this one as well, where artists on both sides of the border created this mural that kind of stretched across the two and made us reconsider what this picture of the border might look like. So those are just some examples of the many examples one could come up with about artists um, trying to transform the meanings of the border, taking this, you know, this difficult, gashing metal existence and saying that's not what we want. We maybe don't have the power to change this structure, but we can talk about what it, you know, another world that could be possible if we could imagine what that would look like. And so I would suggest that when you go to Friendship Park, you think about maybe identifying at least one particular artistic intervention that you think is intriguing and spend some time looking at it. It may be something by one of these artists that I mentioned today. It may be something that just, you know, any visitor could bring paint and paint something or mark something or leave stones on the ground. There's, gar there's gardens along the, the, the edge as well. Whatever you see that's intriguing you that brings, someone has brought beauty to that space on purpose or has brought a message to that space on purpose. So you might want to go and, and find one and think about it and think about like what, what have they done? What's the subject matter? What's the work they're trying to do? What is their intervention? Um, how does the location of that contribute to its meaning? Do they place it next to the water, up high, down low, next to a tree? What are they, what are they trying to say? Um, why do I think that's you, <laughs> why do you think? Why do I think that someone chose to mark this space in this particular way? What meaning does it have to me? Like, what does that section mean when I see it? Ugh, that makes me think this. And what do I think it might mean to different viewers? Lots of different people might pass the park in any given day. It's gonna mean different things to different people. And if you um, are brave, ask someone else from the group, especially someone that you don't know well about a section that they chose and what it meant to them. And then you might think with your students, you could show them pictures of border walls. Uh, you could ask them to look at different artistic interventions. You could go to monuments in your own community and think about what they mean. Um, this is a kind of thought exercise that are useful just for thinking about monuments in general, but also thinking about how people um, transform borders into monuments that have different meanings than what state governments are trying to do. or, or um, at least that's one of the things that you'll see when you're, th when you're there. So I hope you have a wonderful trip, and I hope you have a great experience at Friendship Park, and um, let me know what you think. All right.